the male gender is broken. Let's face it, if you present as male, there's exactly one personality that will earn you social approval. Chad, assertive, dominant, successful. Nobody will be impressed by a male that is meek, submissive, and struggling. Such males are not considered gender trailblazers. They're just derided as incel meats. Nobody is offering an actual solution to this. Tradcons tell you to just man up. TERFs tell you to just abolish gender. Liberals deny this reality altogether. By embracing girl mode, you actually become free to be your authentic self without shame. Society at large requires men to keep grinding and struggling to keep the lights on. So obviously no serious and respectable person will encourage you to just drop down the pink vortex. But it's possibly the only thing that will actually help you if you're stuck being a shitty male with no prospects. This is an excerpt from a guide written for incels that want to transition into womanhood I found about a year ago, and I can't stop thinking about it. So this document is a pretty functional resource guide for starting your transition attached to a cynical manifesto about how transition is a gateway out of the pain of being an incel. It's bizarre enough seeing a transgender self-help walkthrough fused with incel ideology, but the part I'm obsessed with is this tonally insane section where the author talks about their own transition. Each sentence starts with the same level of nihilism, anger, and despair you would expect from an incel writer, which then bloom into sweet, adorable depictions of joy in a way that's invented a new form of comedy for me. During this time, my emotions were becoming far more intense. I would cry at stupid and random stuff, but crying does not feel bad. It feels good and releases emotions. I would care about stuff that didn't even matter. It was almost like hormones were dumbing me down, dumbing me down enough to where I could enjoy life. I was starting to get a feeling, almost like being continually a, a little bit high. It was euphoric, to say the least. My first experience with a guy was a non-Chad friend who knew I had started transitioning thinks I'm actually trans. We didn't have sex or even oral, but we kissed a few times and cuddled for a few hours. It was magical. The cuddles were even better than endless orgasms. Oh my god, maybe you're just trans, you dumb bitch. Going from before transition to right now is like going from black and white reality and low definition to 4K Ultra HD with perfect sound. Even more than that, it's like life is more colorful now and things are so much more intense. The sky even looks brighter. Stars shine more intensely to me. It's like hormones grew a lens of happiness in my brain that now I perceive reality through and it's so much more positive of an experience. Okay, that's actually pretty beautiful and it's literally how every trans girl describes the experience. Please just put down your edgy villain comida hand speeches and admit that you built a better life for yourself. It doesn't have to be this constantly shifting math equation of whose mandibles are wide enough to have happiness. You can just pursue what makes your stars shine more intensely. If you spend any time on 4chan's LGBT board, you'll see a lot of talk about the incel to trans girl pipeline. And a lot of the time, they aren't joking. There's earnest discussion in these spaces about the ways in which self-described incels and needs begin thinking about, making steps towards, and starting on their transitions into womanhood. There's actually two related articles on the incel wiki. One is titled Tranny Maxing. If you're familiar with incel terminology, you've probably already heard of looks maxing, a set of strategies used to compensate for what they perceive as inborn ugliness. And this is basically that, but undergoing transition not to align oneself with an innate sense of gender, but to alleviate the distress of living as an incel. The other article is titled The Transvestigiality Hypothesis, detailing this ludicrous idea that living as an incel caught within a web of perceived and actual gender-based challenges can essentially cause a form of artificial gender dysphoria. There's whole communities dedicated to this connection, with resource lists and even posts listing out scientific studies supposedly validating the idea of this sort of voluntary strategic transition. A lot of these posts come from pre-transition, incel-identified people who write about how deeply they envy women and wish that they could live a life on tutorial mode where they feel wanted. So here's the question. At some point, doesn't the envy of a woman's life become dysphoria? The general social consensus on gender identity right now seems to be based around the mythologized idea of a gendered essence that you're born with. But what does it mean when someone who has lived their entire life as a man, who is comfortable with being a man, transitions? What if that transition is motivated not by the internal feeling, I am a woman, but by something else? 
the desire to escape the pain of your current life, the desire to be desired, the desire to become something you yourself find beautiful. Isao Komori's life is a blank space. Dropped out of college, not pursuing work, no friends, all of his family is far away. He spends his days playing video games, jerking off, and screening calls from his mom, pitifully lying about going to class while living off of his family's monetary deposits. His apartment is filled with bags of garbage he hasn't taken out, some rotting to the point that flies have begun circling. Isao began college life idealizing the concept of a fresh start, hoping to find friendship and opportunity in a new city. However, after waiting for months for someone to approach him, he found himself friendless, surrounded by now solidified cliques. And then, one day, he couldn't do it. He stayed home that day. And the next day. Weeks turned into months. If you withdraw from society for long enough, your social muscles atrophy, the pressure of shame and guilt for evading your responsibilities sealing you into your room. You become calcified locked into the life of an extreme shut-in. Isao's life has one bright spot. Every night when the students and salary workers have all gone home, he goes to the nearby convenience store to pick up food and look at the magazines. And it is there that he sometimes sees the angel of the convenience store, a high school-aged girl whose singular beauty strikes him so deeply that he begins following her. He develops this quiet, intense, nauseating fascination with her, building the idea of her up in his head to angelic heights, an inversion of the abyss that is his own life. Following her out of the store down the dimly lit road becomes a ritual he repeats for an entire year. It offers some sort of antiseptic to his life. College, my mom, employment. I can forget reality altogether if I only follow her lead. Forever and ever. And then, one day, he wakes up as her. This is the inciting incident for Inside Mari, Shuzo Oshimi's dark inversion of gender swap stories. And this manga, for me, is an artistic distillation of the type of pain described in the beginning of this video. In some ways, Inside Mari can help us understand the so-called incel to trans pipeline. And in order to get there, we need to completely understand what is happening in this manga. Before we go any further, I have to give a really big thank you to the manga publisher Dempa, who sent me all of the manga panels I'm using in this video. All nine volumes of Inside Mari are currently available from them, and if you're into collecting physical manga, please consider picking them up. Dempa's a smaller publisher, but their quality is super good. Inside Mari is printed on really nice paper, the color pages at the beginning are included, there are these really nice French flaps with reverse printed art, and the localization and lettering are really well done. I love Dimpa. Please go support them. Video games, lewd mags, convenience store dinners, zero friends, zero prospects, zero hope. This was the life that Isao Komori lived until waking up as the girl he obsessed over, who he soon learned is named Mari. In the first few volumes of the manga, we see the usual friction between one's sense of self and one's new body commonly used for comedy in body swap stories but instead it's inverted into something far more disturbing and nuanced. Isao spent much of his time separate from but obsessed with women's bodies. His connection with women at this point in his life is purely one of distant objectification. And now, within Mari's body, he has rocketed from his state of isolation into the private interior spaces of high school girls. He has to learn about Mari's family and friendships, but where something like your name plays it off as a simple, Oh, you're acting sort of different today. <laughs> Oshimi does a great job depicting the intense discomfort of suddenly being subject to the invisible expectations and minute subtleties of being a teenage girl, especially when it comes to girl friendships. The combination of physical intergroup intimacy and unspoken social expectation leaves Isao, who I'm going to call Isao Mari from now on for reasons that will become apparent, in a constant state of panic and frustration as his desire to survive each day with Mari's social circle intact is impacted and swayed by his pent-up sexual frustrations and years of isolation from women his age. This culminates in several instances of Isao Mari groping and ogling Mari's classmates. These moments of tension are as effective as they are because of how good Shuzo Oshimi is at panel pacing. Pacing in comics is a lot different than pacing in books or film. With movies, the pacing is completely decided by the filmmakers. The audience can't change how long or short a scene is. 
Comics are like books in that you as a reader can read them as fast or as slow as you want, but comics have to worry about a visual dimension that text on its own doesn't. The comic artist sort of has to straddle the worlds of written and visual art, and it presents a really unique challenge. With those constraints in mind, it's amazing that Oshimi is able to pull off breathtaking sequences. He really goes hard on this one technique in particular. The intentional use of short, breathless series of smaller panels leading up to the end of a page, which turns to reveal pure, wordless image, taking up the entirety of a spread, shocking our brain into an emotion quicker than the analytical parts of our mind can catch up to it. Through this sort of paneling, Oshimi can shock us into a frightening empathy with Isao Mari and what he is perceiving and experiencing in the moment. Many of these instances are also in first person, deepening that connection. It isn't just Isao Mari who's gazing at his classmates in a voyeuristic mixture of anxiety and fascination. It's us. In this way, we are woven into him, not just as an audience, but as participants. Isao Mari is one of three main characters in the series. The second is Yori Kakiguchi one of Mari's classmates who's obsessed with her. She immediately catches on to Isao's sudden inhabiting of Mari's body and begrudgingly helps him learn how to fake being her a bit better in the interest of preserving Mari's social standing. The third is Isao Komori, who we'll just call other Isao. And with this, the series hits its main narrative stride. Isao Mari in effect has something resembling a gameplay loop, but instead of exploring a town, fighting enemies, upgrading with loot and leveling, he has investigating the mystery, having an emotional breakdown, alienating everyone around him, and reconciling and leveling up his relationship with Yori. It should be repetitive, but Oshimi is able to entice us with the forward momentum of the detective story elements of clue discovery, only to smash us into pieces with a metric ton of dread and then reward us with a sense of catharsis or growth before enticing us, once again, with new plot developments. As Yori and Isao learn more and grow closer, there are certain details that just don't quite make sense. This actually starts a bit before meeting Yori when Isao Mari tried talking with other Isao, and it immediately became clear that Mari was not inside of him. It wasn't a simple body swap, so where did Mari go? Other Isao also had slightly diverging memories from Isao Mari, claiming to never have followed Mari out of the convenience store. As the investigation continues, more disquieting things come to light. A collection of dirty magazines in Mari's room exactly mirroring the ones Isao would buy, an illustration implying that Mari stalked Isao, all leading to the growing sense that Mari was obsessed with the idea of Isao, someone who lived free from the intense pressures of her world as a teenage girl. As mentioned before, this detective story is constantly derailed by Isao Mari's increasingly turbulent life. By the time we're through the first three volumes, he has completely wrecked Mari's social life, received forceful advances from the boy dating Mari's best friend, had a mental breakdown, skipped school for an extended period to figure out things with other Isao, and had a fight with Mari's parents. And it is in the following volume that we get... Trading bodies with someone else, trying to figure out how to switch back, having to quickly learn how to live as someone else and failing to do so, the absolute horror that is existing as a teenage girl at all. All of these pressures Isao Mari has been under coalesce after the fight with Mari's parents. He finds himself in Mari's room and then looks in the mirror and sees Mari staring back at him. Isao Mari moves toward the mirror and as the two Mari's lips touch, a dark reflection of Isao replaces one of them. It is notable here that Mari is rendered in full detail while Isao is a void-like outline, his murky, vague soul making contact with Mari's fully present body. This is one of the most visually abstract sequences in the manga up to this point, and it continues for the entire following chapter. Isao and Mari, separate for a suspended moment of lust, converge again into Isao Mari. He then disrobes and finally looks fully at Mari, at himself. Up to this point, Isao Mari has made a point not to look at Mari's naked body, for fear of violating her while she isn't present, but now her body falls fully within his gaze. Then. Well, I can't really show or talk about it too much on YouTube, but the rest of this chapter is Isao Mari hungrily exploring this body. At some point, Shadow Isao emerges again, his pupils pulsating holes of scribbled ink, manifesting Isao Mari's pent-up male urges as a dominant, desiring force. He begins saying that he is Mari, and Mari is him. He wants to melt into Mari, to become one with her, and then a chilling, color-inverted Mari with a hole where her face should be, asks, Who are you? I don't know whether or not Isao is trans. 
but the indication does seem to be that he wants to more or less embody and become Mari. In this way, inside Mari represents some of trans women's worst fears, that we're not really women, that we're men in love with the idea of ourselves as the women we lust after, that we are appropriating femininity, that the act of transition is one that aims to steal and violate approximations of female bodies. Isao in the sequence states that he wants to melt into Mari to become her fully, but that desire is tied up with his erotic fascination of her body. The sequence is literally autogynephilia rendered as a stunning piece of visual expression. By the time I was through with it, nausea and excitement were competing in my stomach. The pain of seeing one of the worst tactics used against trans people rendered within a manga, contrasting with the absolute pleasure and wonder that comes with observing true, transcendent art. After we see that horrifying panel of faceless Mari, Isao Mari receives a shocking phone call. It's… Mari. There are quick, tiny frames of Isao Mari's naked body, his shame at what he just did, sharpening against the sudden presence of the owner of that body. Throughout the series, there is this weird disconnect between Isao Mari and other Isao. This wedge between two people who should essentially be the same person widens with each volume as Isao Mari becomes increasingly desperate to prove that he's the same person as other Isao, while other Isao grows more and more infatuated with his idea of who Isao Mari is. Every time Isao Mari talks to other Isao, he should be feeling kinship, but there's always this distance. The distance of other Isao objectifying Isao Mari's body and slowly falling for him. The distance of Isao Mari's desperation to get back into his life. A distance filled by the growing body of evidence that Mari isn't who everyone thought she was. Isao Mari says you're me or I'm you often in these conversations, almost as if he has to reassure himself of that fact. Other Isao just nervously goes along with it, not feeling any sense of connection or confidence that Isao Mari is who he says he is. We see this dynamic stretch to its breaking point when Other Isao confesses to Isao Mari. In the lashing rain, Other Isao has appeared outside of Mari's bedroom window to confess his love. What begins as firm statements from Isao Mari that they're both the same person devolves as Other Isao rejects that argument, going into a desperate, embarrassing plea, saying he'll go back to college, turn his life around, and get a job all for Mari. And then, it becomes sheer pain. I'm telling you, I'm not Mari! That's a lie! It's not a lie! Listen to me. I didn't get you off because I'm in love with you or anything like that. It's because I'm pawn scum. You're pawn scum. Because that's what the real Mari-san thought when she looked at me. Come on. I'd never go out with you. You make me sick. Panels and panels of nothing but rain. The words that were said are given room to settle in our minds. And then a piercing scream from other Isao. And one final unison sentiment quiet, and from the gut. I'm, I'm so, so gross. gross. Isao Mari is pushed further and further into the role of a teen girl, not just by other Isao's confession. The weight of everyone's expectations bear down. Even Yori in the ensuing chapters begins treating him more delicately. Things fall apart. The mysterious Mari phone calls turn out to have been other Isao, using a voice changer to try and manipulate Isao Mari. The three main characters confront one another about the call, Isao Mari's physical intimacy with other Isao, everything. Things fall apart. Isao Mari kisses Yori. This is a whirlwind psychodrama, characters innermost animal drives coming to the surface. Things fall apart. Mercifully, there's this sweet little reprieve we get with Mari's brother once Isao Mari returns home. They talk, they play video games. I'm really grateful for this gentle human connection. Oshimi is known mostly as someone who captures the basest, most awful, violent, psychosexual drives of people, but he can also render the subtle pleasures of everyday life. The slow squares of light cast by a window that travel down the floor. The small, divine pleasure of growing fond and comfortable with another person. The nervous glances towards someone you have a crush on. The only reason the near-relentless pain of his stories is effective is because it's countered by these sparse, fragile moments of beauty. Unfortunately, we can't stay in the moment forever. A childhood photograph sparks a memory within Isao Mari. That memory leads to the name Fumiko and the image of a ferris wheel. Yori and Isao Mari go to the theme park that houses the ferris wheel, but oddly, it feels less like an investigation and more like a first date. Oshimi's talent for tiny interior loveliness is fully explored here. 
The two go on rides, play at attractions, and oh my god, I cried. I really truly cried when I saw these smiles. There's this delicate line of hope that comes from these characters being able to experience joy and togetherness despite the hell that they've been through. The ferris wheel looms, inevitable, but as Yuri says, we've still got time. Let's go on a few rides first. Just a few more. From this point, I'll be discussing some revelations and plot details that occur late in the series. I believe this series is still 100% enjoyable, even if you know what I'll be talking about, but if you'd like to avoid any spoilers, go ahead and skip to the time indicated on screen. They board the ferris wheel, and once their car reaches the very top, Isamari unlocks a memory that lets him know Mari was originally named Fumiko, a name chosen by her paternal grandmother. After that grandmother passed away, her mother renamed her Mari. It's difficult to explain without recounting the scene verbatim, but this wasn't simply a parent renaming her child. It came across far more like someone fundamentally altering their child's sense of self. This look on her face? That's the look of someone who has utterly deleted her daughter's identity. She isn't looking at Mari, she's fixing her in a gaze. After that revelation, Isao Mari falls into a near comatose state. One of my favorite narrative devices I've seen used quite a few times is something I like to call the Walk of Heaven. Sometimes in a piece of fiction, usually towards the climax and after a lot of trauma that the characters can't return from, two characters get to meet in a metaphysical space and go on a walk together. Harry Potter and Dumbledore did it in the Deathly Hollows. The final episode of Madoka does this multiple times. Hedwig and the Angry Inch did it in probably one of the most stunning uses of a musical number I've ever seen. And Oshimi uses it here too. Within Mari's body, Mari takes Isao on a walk. In the first volume, Inside Mari was drawn with heavy liner and some shading by hand, but mostly achieved through standard screen tones. By now, Inside Mari has morphed into a fully hand-drawn, intricately cross-hatched, gorgeously raw piece of art. The screen tones and bold lines giving way to far more figurative and impressionist sketchiness, mirroring the plot and experiences of Isao Mari in the previous chapters as he collapses into full-on ego death. But here, these delicate lines feel far kinder and quieter. Mari offers him chocolate, and I can't explain it, but there's something so gentle about that. They walk on, Isao remarking that he feels like he's forgotten something important, and then they come upon little Fumiko, lost and crying. When her mother shattered her sense of self, Fumiko, the little girl so full of love, was fragmented off of Mari, stuck in a perpetual state of static trauma and sadness within Mari's soul. Mari offers to lead Fumiko home. The two girls walk into the void, seemingly erasing themselves so that Isao can inhabit the body, but not before Mari leaves one last hint. She has seen Isao's journal, a journal that Isao Mari has no memory of keeping in his previous life. Other Isao has moved back home after his mother learns that he's dropped out of college, and Isao Mari and Yori travel to go see him and ask for the journal. Isao's mother greets them and... <laughs> You're completely different from the mother I knew. They sit down with other Isao. He hands them his journal and leaves. It's just Isao, Mari, and Yori now. He reads the journal, and it all locks into place. I'm Isao Komori. There's this type of psychological therapy called internal family systems, or more commonly, parts therapy. It's an approach that seeks to understand the mind as a system of multiple parts, and underlying them is the person's true self. These parts are like members of a family, constantly communicating and negotiating with themselves, the outside world, and your core sense of self. Parts, IFS states, all have positive intent but can be forced by trauma to become extreme versions of themselves. Through this sort of damage, parts can make decisions for us that cause dysfunction. When someone undergoes something traumatic at a young age, some part of them may end up carrying that fear and pain and keep it from growing along with the rest of your parts. The goal of IFS is to heal the parts of you that are hurt and work with them, not exile them or destroy them, to create internal harmony and balance between your parts and yourself. In a white void, Isao meets Mari and Fumiko again, and he understands. Isao Mari was never in Isao Komori's body. He was a false Isao, constructed by Mari after idealizing Isao's life so intensely that she had a psychotic break. He was able to live and not be gazed upon by anyone. He was free from responsibility, from pressure, from the mortifying ordeal of having been known. But Mari herself was a construct. Fumiko created her when her mother fractured her sense of self. 
Mari, after all the pain and isolation she's been through, wants to disappear, to have Isao take over the body and live life for himself through her. But Isao, a part of her that has caused extreme dysfunction in her social, family, and academic life, and Fumiko, a part of her that has fossilized pain and fear, smile, extend their hands to her, and invite her to join them. On the surface, Yori cries over Mari's body, pleading for Isao to come back. Mari wakes up in her own body to see Isao and Fumiko's ethereal forms. Where are you going? You said we'd go together, right? We are together. We'll always be watching over you. It'll be okay. Yori-san, see you. Isao and Fumiko were parts. Mari was the core self all along. Before the series ends, we get to see Mari and Yori graduate. Yori going off to college and Mari not quite making it into one. Maybe they'll stay friends, maybe they won't, but it's okay. We get to see Isao finally stable and supported and needed. Oshimi leaves us with Mari walking home, hearing her name spoken by someone and smiling. Making assumptions about the worldviews, feelings, and experiences of artists you don't personally know is always a bad idea, but I'm literally going to do that here because I have unhealthy parasocial feelings about Shuzo Oshimi. We'll start with some basic information. Oshimi was born in 1981 in what was then a rural area of Japan's Gunma Prefecture. He was a shy child who gravitated towards drawing manga early on. His father exposed him to modernist poet Sakutaro Hagiwara and symbolist painter Od Odilon, Odilon Redon both of whom, along with detective novel Dogura Magura and the manga magazine Garo, acted as formative artistic influences. Growing up, he felt a deep sense of despair from the suffocating remoteness of his village, a feeling he wanted to portray in many of his series, most prominently in Flowers of Evil. All of the artistic influences he was taking in would transform under the extreme pressure of his rural hometown into themes he would eventually explore in all of his manga. In middle school, he became fascinated with the classmate who was in the softball club, and he joined the tennis club so he could more easily watch her from afar. To his surprise, he ended up dating her, but the relationship ultimately failed, causing him to feel that he was, at his core, incapable of being loved. This entire dynamic, a boy quietly following and obsessing over a girl completely out of his league, that boy inexplicably being able to date her, and the relationship inevitably degrading are dynamics he explores again and again and again in his work. He developed a stutter in middle school, and it became extremely difficult to communicate with his classmates. Robbed of his words, he became much more sensitive to how someone's face can communicate what their voice cannot, which can be seen in the subtle nonverbal cues in his manga characters. Over the years, drawing these faces has become a way for him to express that which he can't in words. In college, Oshimi brought his work to the editorial department of Kodansha's weekly young magazine where it was evaluated as cruel yet entertaining. Whoever that editor was, they should get a raise because those words perfectly predicted Oshimi's entire career. His work won a rookie award and he began regularly publishing shortly after. After a few one-shots and short series, he gained notoriety for Drifting Net Cafe, a reinterpretation of the classic manga Drifting Classroom, which was Oshimi's first manga to be adapted for TV. From there, he went on to create the notorious Flowers of Evil, Inside Mari, Happiness, Blood on the Tracks, and the recently debuted Welcome Home Alice, all of which can be considered some of the most striking and moving manga of the last decade. At the end of many volumes of his manga, after exposing the interior trauma and lives of his characters, Oshimi directs his dissecting gaze inward, towards himself, and the many afterwards he writes. In these small cross-sections of his life, the vulnerability with which he reveals himself can sometimes be overwhelming. In these brief glimpses into his life, I sometimes felt like an unwilling therapist, forced to learn about some of the most uncomfortable aspects of this person, obliterating the wall of respect and distance between artist and audience. Oshimi peels back the layers of outward civility in his characters to reveal their innermost selves, and he does that to himself here. Even in some of the most harrowing autobiographies I've read, there's usually this sense of disconnect, a certain dignity the author maintains that is totally absent here. When Oshimi talks about his first erection, you can tell through his tone that he's ashamed to talk about this, but it's almost as if he can't help himself, and that made me extremely uncomfortable reading it. But in that discomfort, that vacuum left after the destruction of the wall of respectability, there's an invitation for us to examine ourselves and connect with the author in a unique and genuine way. 
and fans have let him know about that connection. We know Oshimi felt isolated growing up in a remote village, but the ways he describes those feelings in the flowers of evil afterwards is so deeply crushing. And the ways he depicts this both in fiction and in afterwards resulted in numerous people who feel or have felt trapped in their rural hometowns reaching out and thanking him for that sense of connection. That said, there's this afterward at the end of the first volume of Inside Mari. I'm gonna go through it now. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for reading Volume 1 of Inside Mari. Have any of you male readers ever wanted to become a girl? I have. I'm talking about a sex change. Wanting to dress up like a woman is a little different. Yes, it is. After all, no matter how much you look like a girl, if you've got the mindset of a man, then you're not a girl. In other words, I'm not talking about lust here. If a man becomes a woman when he sees his new female body, he'll still perceive it through the eyes of male lust, and would then get further and further away from being a woman. That's not what I'd want. I'd want to turn into a woman in both body and mind. I want to be born as a girl, be brought up as a girl, live my life as a girl, and just be a genuine girl. Do you want to know why? Because to me, girls are half of the world. As a man, I can only see the world as a man. There's no way I can see the world as a woman, so it is my wish to venture into that half of the world I can't reach, but I'll never be able to achieve that. It's impossible. But... but still, I... Uh... Uh... uh no good. I am no good at getting my feelings across. Well, I thought about that topic while creating this manga. Thank you for being a good listener. I hope we meet again. I don't want to get too parasocial, but that is gender dysphoria. To be born a girl, brought up as a girl, I want that. I want that so bad I could die. In the space of this afterward, I felt seen by and connected to this creator. What does this sort of confession mean about Inside Mari? I don't have any idea, but I know that Oshimi has articulated a feeling so integral to my sense of self that I felt naked reading it. I don't know, I just felt it. You know? So, we see the neat aspect. Isao Komori obviously fits in here. But by the time it ends, it seems like Inside Mari is not a story about being trans at all. But, like... Isn't it a little bit? Isao Mari might have just been a fabricated identity, but he existed. If a replicant in Blade Runner has implanted memories, those experiences, artificial or not, manifest into a very real personality. I mean, Yori even felt it physically when he left. Isao Mari believed he was a male shut-in who wished deeply to become Mari because his life was awful and becoming beautiful and pure would have alleviated that pain. He made decisions and had behavior based on those perceived experiences, so isn't that real in a way? I started this video talking about the concept of the incel to trans pipeline, and Isao Mari, until the identity synthesis that occurs at the end of the story, is pretty much in that pipeline. He reflects so much of the bleak pain you can see in these 4chan and forum posts, as well as the desire to become a woman for reasons that aren't quite in line with what society generally thinks of as valid reasons to transition. The concept of needs people who are not currently in education, employment, or training, and hikikomori, a term used to describe a particularly advanced form of shut-in who has almost completely disengaged from the outside world, are culturally entwined with incels, and they are explored in many different anime and manga. From relatively lighthearted joking portrayals to subtle and substantial portraits, there's a sense that many anime and manga are trying to reckon with the unique and brutal interior pain of extreme shut-in behavior. In the 2019 Intelligencer article, The World of American Hikikomori, a young man named Luca self-identified as a hikikomori after hearing the term from Welcome to the NHK. And honestly, I completely relate to anyone who struggles with these tendencies. Living a public life with professional and personal responsibilities is painful. Being visible and vulnerable to other people and subject to their assumptions and expectations is painful. Being expected to compete in a job not only for status but for the money to be able to live at all is painful. Drawing inward, closing the door, turning off the lights, and turning on your computer, it can feel like freedom from all of that, but really, it just becomes another prison. One far scarier. One way to leave that pain, some incels propose, is to transition. 
If the generally accepted reasons for transitioning are having this internal sense of being a woman, having dysphoria, or both, then the incel to trans pipeline or trans vestigiality hypothesis suggests that men who are deeply alienated from society can develop a sort of artificial dysphoria and transition not as a way to metaphysically align your body with your true sense of self, but as a somewhat intentional strategy to stop pain and improve your life prospects. Isao Mari perceived his life to be so incredibly painful that he idealized the idea of turning into Mari. Incel culture deeply, painfully covets femininity. 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 There's the obvious sexual and romantic aspiration aspect, but the way that they romanticize and idealize these supposedly easy and charmed lives of women are often laced with a level of resentment adjacent to jealousy. I'm trying to remain as sympathetic and open as possible, but I do have to be clear here. The rhetoric they use to try and understand women is ghoulish and bizarre, a series of cruel and strange assumptions wearing an unconvincing costume of scientific objectivity. The degree to which they have to collectively convince themselves that women are a rudimentary set of chat-seeking algorithms is pretty astonishing. But no one is denying that we as a collective society treat girls different than boys and women different than men. Like many other trans women, my life has become harder in many ways, but also much, much easier in other ways. I'm certainly treated more delicately. I am able to openly express emotion and not be judged as harshly. People smile at me more and are generally more friendly, but there's an inherent trade-off. I'm sometimes taken less seriously in professional settings, and a lot of that friendliness is pretense for sexual pursuit. Despite these drawbacks, the isolation, emotional numbness, and competitiveness expected of masculinity is no longer in my life, and I am in so much less pain because of it. The idea of leaving the pain of daily life and becoming a girl, or a femininely beautiful character more generally, is something that's also not uncommon in isekai stories. A 28-year-old cram school teacher spends his entire life being chivalrous and gets rejected for being a nice guy. He then dies and is reincarnated as a beautiful warrior. Yakuza falls in an ambush by a rival gang and is reincarnated as a fantasy world princess. A 33-year-old unemployed man whose life prospects were irreparably damaged by his Trinivio delusions dies and is reincarnated as a cute girl who helps run her family's restaurant. A lazy guy dies of sleep apnea and gets reincarnated as a beautiful OP vampire. A male character who sunk countless hours into an MMORPG gets stuck in the game as his female character. A 37-year-old salaryman dies defending his kohai and is reborn as an amorphous slime blob, who eventually becomes a cute feminine androgyne. Fellas, is it gay to fall in love with your bro if he reincarnates as a hot girl? So, does this trend really have anything to do with the aforementioned incel the trans pipeline? Well, isekai is essentially about leaving behind a world of pain, and incels and neats inhabit a world mostly built of pain. A lot of these so-called trans maxers talk about transition within a framing of escapism. There's no scientific way I can back up this connection, but isn't there something similar to a traumatized shut-in deemed worthless by society transformed into a powerful, socially valued hero, and a traumatized shut-in deemed worthless by themselves becoming someone who, if they pass and if they actually get pretty privilege, is finally, mercifully desired? Both are instances of someone attaining that which they covet. So, what happens after that transition? The incel wiki would have you believe that your prospects improve dramatically if you're able to pass, and there are a few documented cases of extreme 100% happy success stories. But if you lurk on LGBT or on some of the Discord servers, those same incel brainworms are still there, just slightly different. Trips and server members post selfies constantly, asking if they pass or if it's over. These girls still feel the icy vice grip of incel ideology and their sense of self-worth. It's just, now instead of analyzing whether or not their canthal tilt is too negative to allow them to access the sexual marketplace, they're analyzing whether their canthal tilt is too positive to pass as a woman. Incel terms mog and it's over are used constantly, as well as a colorful lexicon of borrowed and completely invented terms like passoid, gigapassoid, young shit, hun, twink hun, giga hun, boy motor, man motor, monster motor, repressor, Obviously, these girls are not okay. The only reason I know about this stuff is that I get addicted to it when I'm not okay. I think the fact that a lot of trans women who post selfies in these communities both pass and are conventionally attractive and still can't access the easy mode blissful existence they envisioned really says something both about how accurate the incel conception of the world is and how damaging that mode of thinking can be to people caught up in it. But they even have an answer for that. It's BPD passoid behavior. Not every edgy online trans space is like this. There are a lot of wholesome places full of camaraderie you can find where you do find Blanchard and boy motor memes, but 
The further away from 4chan you get, the more the intention seems to be connection and communal identity through humor, rather than this horrible restrictive language that just fosters self-hatred and isolation. I actually really like a lot of the boy motor memes. In a lot of these, I guess you could call them soft, edgy spaces, I've seen more than a few formerly identified incels completely escape that ideology after transitioning. They're able to find happiness and let go of that intense, painful fixation. The incel conception of the world is broken beyond any utility, and I'm really deeply happy for anyone who gets out of that horrible spiral of thinking, especially if they're escaping gender dysphoria at the same time. Some of the most gut-wrenching things I see in these threads come not from people posting the selfies, but from anons who reply begging the OP to please, please go outside and block 4chan from their browsers because it's killing their concept of themselves. Despite all of this, I keep coming back to the question of the transvestigiality hypothesis. Separating all of the misogynist brain rot from the concept isn't easy, but I think there's still a potentially valuable question we can ask ourselves. If someone's desire to transition is an intentional construct devised to avoid pain, isn't it just as real as anyone else's dysphoria? When I was growing up, I didn't have the language for the pain I was experiencing. I was a pretty cute kid when I was little. My mom kept my hair long and she tells me I got mistaken for a girl a lot. We lived sort of out in the middle of the forests of Indiana, and the only people I saw pretty much for the entire first four years of my life were my mom, our neighbors, and then my baby sister when she was born. We moved to Texas after that and I started school. I have this one memory from the first day of kindergarten. I was really nervous and I didn't know how to approach any of these other kids who had somehow already started talking to one another. But then a girl approached me. We started talking and I felt this sense of relief. Maybe I could do this. Maybe talking with other kids was easy. At some point though, I don't remember what it was, but something clicked in her mind and she said, Oh, you're a boy? And then left to talk with other girls. I felt my face get hot and I remember feeling really embarrassed but not knowing why. I remember distinctly, even that early, the sense that I could never connect to classmates in the same way they connected with each other. It was like everyone studied for the same test that I never got the material for. I always felt this uncrossable distance between myself and everyone else, and it felt wider and wider every year. My mom finally cut my hair short, and I remember looking at myself with a boy haircut for the first time and feeling, I don't know, not pained, just weird. Like I wasn't there. I remember in first or second grade looking in the bathroom mirror and thinking to myself, that's me, and really trying to feel in my bones that the person looking back at me was me, and I started crying. As I aged past second grade, sports and competition became heavily emphasized for me and all the other boys around me. I was a thin-wristed, neurotic, sensitive boy who was terrible at sports and hated competing or conflict in general, but those things became expected of me. The longer I didn't fit into that, the more other boys separated from me. Alienation became bullying. I just wanted to play video games and read books, but even outside of school, every adult man in my life pushed me towards athletic activity and tried to instill within me the value of dominating someone else through competitive power. I think a lot of them took it upon themselves because I was raised by just my mom for all of elementary school and they felt like I lacked a good paternal role model. I was lucky to never experience that pressure from my mom or my sister for the most part. I got really chubby starting in fifth grade, and by the time I entered middle school, I was being made fun of for being fat. I asked for a buzz cut because I hated how I looked anyways, so might as well have hair with no maintenance. Middle school was really, really awful. There was this one kid, let's call him C-Chan, who became weirdly obsessed with making every day at school for me as awful as possible. He beat me up pretty regularly, and in 7th and 8th grade, he threatened to kill me if I hung out with anyone that he didn't want me to, so I stopped talking with any of my friends. He would constantly call me a f**k-it for the way I acted. Pretty quickly, I learned to become servile and agreeable because I was terrified of getting hurt. He would say awful things about me, and I would just laugh and agree. At the same time, I started feeling really drawn towards femininity as I began puberty, but I knew this was something I could never admit to anyone. I would download and arrange pictures of girls from anime I watched, who I wish I looked like on Word documents and print them out. 
I became obsessed with characters like Fisheye from Sailor Moon or Ranma from Ranma. I wanted so bad to be able to wear clothes like that and look cute. I would stare at these pictures every night and and feel disgusting and horrible afterwards. Because of my body that I increasingly saw as disgusting and my self-esteem that was being eroded by Si chan I was so caught up in shame and an intense desire to hide from the world that I couldn't bear to openly explore these feelings. I was bullied for being really emotional and sensitive, but girls were supposedly valued and desired for having those traits. Which isn't to say I think that girls had it easier, I think it's the opposite. But I wanted what I thought girls had. Their permission to be softer. I had a growth spurt in the summer between middle school and high school, and as I let my hair grow out, I suddenly became taller, thinner, and the round cheeks that had only months earlier made me look like a fat boy now made me look almost androgynous. I got into a high school for kids that tested really well, that prioritized low-income families. It was a school with a lot of gifted, troubled kids, and the graduation class sizes were so small that bullying became almost a non-issue, at least for me. Even with my growth spurt, I was still much smaller and cute looking than a lot of the other boys, which helped me become friends with a lot of girls almost immediately. A lot of them would want to put makeup on me or dress me up like a girl, and it was literally a dream come true. I was so incredibly deep in shame and couldn't ever admit to anyone that I wanted to be cute and feminine, so someone else wanting me to be that way absolves me of that guilt. After the first year of high school, I slowly became more masculine. Dark peach fuzz eventually became a patchy beard. My head hair became more coarse, my baby fat burned off revealing angular bone. I smelled different. I got stronger without really trying at all. I stopped eating as much because, in the back of my mind, I couldn't stand the idea of getting any bigger or more muscular. I felt increasingly like I wasn't in my body, like I was manipulating a distant puppet or video game character. On the surface, I was an easygoing, fun person to be around who was good at listening, but if anyone asked me my feelings or opinions or experiences regarding anything beyond a surface level, I would freeze and not know how to respond. I wouldn't say that I was ever an incel, but I relate deeply to the struggle of social isolation and an essential feeling of being unwanted. I never felt like I could perform masculinity correctly, and isn't that exactly what's at the heart of being an incel? I could never measure up to other men physically. I was small and weak, comparatively. I never understood how to socially embody masculinity either. Every time I tried to date a girl, I was so passive it would end before it started. There was something so deeply wrong inside of me, some invisible wall that separated me from the perceived success my male peers had achieved. The term failed male is sometimes used by former incels who have transitioned to describe themselves. I totally relate to it. But I knew I couldn't be a girl either. I looked more manly every day. By the junior year of high school, those feelings of not wanting to be a boy were getting harder and harder to ignore. I would avoid mirrors because I hated getting confronted with what I looked like. Every picture taken of me gave me a small jolt of almost physical pain when I looked at it. It was around this time that I tried to get my first part-time job. There was a shopping center I really liked and I wanted to try applying to some of the stores there during the summer between my junior and senior year. I had my mom drop me off on the way to her job. It was early enough that everything was closed so I decided to just walk around until the first stores opened up and I could ask for job applications. A car pulled up to me and a guy rolled down his window and asked what I was doing. I told him, and he said he owned a restaurant nearby and he'd be happy to drive me there and interview me on the spot. I got in his car and- My mom was crying when she picked me up. We went to the police station, but they didn't really take me seriously because I was a boy and it didn't sound like I fought him off or anything. We got home and I took a shower for three hours and slept for the rest of the day. I hated my body, so why did he want it? Why am I so disgusting? What is wrong with me? I didn't tell anyone besides my mom about what happened. I repressed it, and I got a job somewhere else. But I couldn't visit that shopping center for a long time. I spent a lot of my discretionary money that I now had on women's clothing, which I would build a stash of and keep secret until I grew too ashamed of it and threw it out, only to start over again. A lot of things came to a head in one phone call. I was really close friends with this one girl who was going through a lot. She would call me to vent sometimes, and I would listen, but not really offer much more than, that sucks, or, I'm so sorry this is happening. One day when I was on the phone with her, after giving her one of those template answers, she responded, 
What's wrong with you? Is that really all you can say? It feels like I'm talking to a robot. Don't you have anything else to say besides what you always do? I share so much of myself with you and I feel like I don't even know you. Three years of being your friend and I have no idea who you are. I couldn't answer. I was stuck. I wanted to tell her about myself, but I was terrified of revealing a part of me I viewed as sick and degenerate. You have to understand, this was back in the mid-2000s before trans people had any mainstream acceptance. And I was in Texas. For a long time, I didn't even know you could transition. The next day, I texted her and said, I have to tell you something in person. It was after school, my hands were sweaty and shaking and I couldn't look her in the eye, but I managed to tell her that I liked cross-dressing and that I wished I could look pretty all the time. And she accepted me. The first thing she said was, this makes so much sense now. That was the first time I felt like there was any way forward. I stayed pretty small and not super masculine throughout high school, but by the time I was in college, the interval between my increasingly masculine body and my internal sense of myself was causing me constant, continuous distress. I tried the whole dress more mask thing and grow a beard, and that lasted for about a month. Even in 2010 in Texas, the university library had a small but respectable LGBT section, and I began spending most of my time in between classes there reading whatever I could about gender nonconformity and trans issues. As I learned more and more, I hit a wall. The way trans people were described in most of these books, they all had this deeply solidified sense that their soul was female. As children, they wore their mom's high heels, they outright said that they were girls to their family. Even with the amount of dysphoria I was going through, I didn't have any such certainty. I knew I was in pain, but it was complicated by this feeling that I wasn't really trans, that I was tricking myself into trying to legitimize something that was just a fetish. I loved women's bodies, I knew I desired them, and also wanted to live as one, but I couldn't imagine myself within one. There was something so pleasing about the thought, something so deeply indulgent that it felt perverse. As I read more and more, I took in second wave feminist ideology and began to internalize it. What if I was just a socially disaffected male whose desire to control women was distorted inwardly? What if I was appropriating women's bodies by wanting to become one? My school offered psychological counseling as part of its subsidized university healthcare. When the pain grew unbearable, I sought out a therapist there. I attended group sessions where I would go over my desire to be feminine, my distress at the thought of aging into an older man, the pain at trying to wear makeup and just looking like a man in unpracticed drag, and my complicated uncertainty. After a few months of these sessions, the counselor asked if I had considered that I was simply a crossdresser and that I was overthinking things. Oh, I guess that's it, I thought. I left counseling and I was more confused than ever. Every day I felt more dissociated than the last. Every day my pain grew greater, and all the while I couldn't figure out what I was. Am I a man or am I a woman? Am I a fetishist or am I a real girl? Am I Sal or am I Mari? I went through an abusive relationship, I got out of that, and then a co-worker at my part-time job started talking to me about God. I had sort of fallen out of religion after growing up in the church, never really formally embracing atheism, but finding enough things to disagree with that I stopped attending. I was at a weak time in my life and needed something to latch onto, so my evangelical phase started. I got invited to a lot of Bible studies and I knew something felt off still, but I felt like I just wasn't trying hard enough. I convinced myself that the reason I wasn't feeling the Holy Spirit was because I couldn't let go of my ego and give myself over to Christ. I spent a weekend at a mega church retreat and I still remember that experience quite vividly. At the intake we were divided into women and men and ushered into this cavernous hall. A pastor came out and began his sermon backed by softly building butt rock played by the church band. At one point he said something to the effect of, I know there are some of you out there who are underage drinkers. Some of you are on drugs. Some of you are struggling with homosexual urges. Some of you don't even know if you're a boy or a girl. I felt in that moment as if a spotlight had fallen on me. With those words, it was like God was staring straight into my soul. All of my trouble with gender, the social isolation, the inescapable feeling that some part of me was degenerate and rotten, it was all visible to him. Please. Please tell me what to do, I thought. Please fix my heart, please. Make me whole. But 
there was no response. The sermon ended and I was left with this feeling of complete and utter emptiness. There were no hands to catch me from this fall. After that, I drank a lot. I wanted to just stop living. I want to say I hated myself, but at the time, I didn't even know who myself was. Then, a year later, I returned to counseling. I had one-on-one -on -one sessions with a new therapist this time. After weeks of explaining again what I was going through, the intense oscillation between thoughts of, I can just suck it up and be a straight man and have a family, and I think I'm dying. I think I'll die if I don't transition. My therapist asked one simple question. Well, does it really matter if you're a girl or not? It sounds like you're in pain. Real pain. And you know what you can do to make it go away. That's right. It didn't matter. Everything melted away. So what if I was a degenerate pervert? The fact that this pain was real and not going away meant that transitioning was the correct path. I signed up for the waitlist for HRT at a nearby informed consent clinic, and a few months later, in December of 2011, I began taking the medicine that saved my life. In the first few weeks, I remember looking at a video of some cats playing and suddenly crying. Deep, heaving sobs. I could feel. Not in the distanced, echoed way I had been. Real, actual, electric emotion. Those tears were the emotional backup of more than a decade of disconnection with my body. I could feel again. Slowly, I saw my body change. First, my body odor became nearly non-existent then my face slowly began to soften. About half a year after starting, I could look at myself in the mirror and not feel disgust. Within two years, I actually sometimes even liked what I saw. I think I probably seem far less emotionally stable and far more fragile now than before I transitioned, but that's because I'm still processing and sorting out two decades worth of stunted emotions and repressed trauma I didn't actually feel in the moment when they occurred. Despite still facing a lot of pain, I am able, for the first time in my life, to feel happy. In this way, my transition was a construct I devised in order to escape pain. My initial feelings were, I don't know if I want to be a girl, but I don't want to be a boy. I just want to be pretty. Honestly, I still don't know if I'm a girl. I don't know what it means to be a girl. I've gone in and out of the labels of trans woman, trans feminine, non-binary, lesbian, bi, pan, and none of that matters that much to me now. None of that can ever describe the nuances of existing as a person. It's beyond language. I don't fault anyone for finding utility or comfort in identity terminology, that's not what I'm saying. I just feel this sick feeling when the weight of assumption that comes with each label touches my skin. Boy, young man, woman, trans, gay, non-binary, deviant, bi, pan, scared, lost child, these are all names I can give to parts of myself. But the underlying core sense of self was screaming to be seen, so I transitioned in order to do that. And now, this body is me. I am here. In an earlier section, I talked about Oshimi's confessed wish to have been born a girl. I was a bit disingenuous because I omitted the fact that Oshimi has since publicly changed how he describes his relationship with gender. What Oshimi says here implies a desire not to change his label from male to female, but to escape the idea of having to be labeled in the first place. He describes pain at viewing his body and reference photos, pain at the expectations of maleness, and isn't that one of the key components of dysphoria? 
I don't mean to say that Oshimi is unequivocally a closeted trans person, I don't know at all. That's why I've continued to use male pronouns. What I want to convey is that he hates that the world has expectations of him as a man. That the pain he feels is the reduction of his entire soul to an easily parsed set of ideas about manhood. The entirety of this person, too. Fumiko, whose name and sense of self were overwritten by her mother. Mari, who was crushed under the leering gazes of her peers, her family, and nearly every man who looked at her. And Isao Mari, who wanted his pain to be understood, and who wanted to lose himself within the transformative feminine forgiveness. They all had their identities stolen. They don't want to be gazed upon. They want, as it has been stated throughout the entire series, for you to look at them. Mari is just Mari, and I am just me. At the end of the story, we don't see Mari being plastered with labels of dissociative identity disorder or mentally unstable. Mari is just Mari. And while she has cut off her route to college for now, like you and me, her life is open to transform into whatever possibilities can equal the measure of her ability and access. The horizon is right there. You can run towards it if you want. Whether you're an incel or a leftist or trans or queer or marginalized in any number of other ways or literally all of the above, underneath all of this, there is the untamable, infinite potential of you. If you feel lost, if you feel like your identity is drowning under this constant noise, if you find yourself cornered by the terms and assumptions the world has chosen for you, I want to tell you that you are you, unbreakably, simply you. Why do we make videos? Why do any of us create things? Why do any of us pursue the doomed, beautiful endeavor of trying to communicate to someone else? Because we want someone to understand. Because we want someone else to feel what we feel. Because underneath all of our parts, there is a wonderful whole person who is hungry to meet other wonderful whole people. Because I, like Mari, want you to look at me. I don't know if I'm a boy. I don't know if I'm a man I know I want to be called pretty But I don't know if I want titties I guess I could say gender non-conforming But I've done really well conforming And non-binary doesn't have the ring I've been looking for I am Jake and I am Foster I am something in the middle But I'm fine about these names